Okay, so we are in the middle of analysis uh, now. Um, and what did we do last time? Yes, we talked about continuity, continuous functions and discontinuous functions. Um, yes, and uh, so we stopped at this point and uh, let's look at a quite a nice example. In this example, this is an example where we prove that a function is not continuous. And we look at this function, the sine of 1 over x. Yeah? Um, and I mean, if you take the sine of x, everybody has this picture with these oscillations, uh, homogeneous uh, over the whole uh, real axis. But what happens before we take the sine is this 1 over x. And this function 1 over x, this is kind of a, um, a mirror image at the 1. Yeah? Let's look at the real axis. Yeah, so here we have 0 and there is 1. And, and uh, this uh, 1 over x function maps all numbers between 1 and, inf and infinity to this interval 0, 1. And uh, at the same time, it maps all numbers between 0 and 1 onto the interval 1 to infinity. Okay? So what we have here is um, we get this whole interval towards infinity uh, squeezed into this interval 0, 1. That's quite important. That means we have in this interval infinitely many oscillations of the sine function. Huh? And it actually looks like this. Huh? So here you see we have this interval 0, 1. And uh, we start here. This is one oscillation. And then it's getting more and more dense towards zero. And the density of oscillations is getting infinite uh, as we approach zero. OK, so that's our intuition of this function. It's not easy to, to draw this function. Uh, and maybe you, you see it. I drew, I drew this picture again because the resolution in the image you have in the script is not high enough. Huh? OK, and now, I mean, this function is continuous everywhere except in the origin. I mean, no matter how close you get to the origin, it is continuous. But in the origin, it is not continuous. And now, how can we prove this? I mean, it is not so trivial. Your intuition of, of discontinuous functions may be like there is a pole. If there is a pole, then immediately we know function is not continuous in this point. And this, this 1 over x would have a pole. But we take the sine of 1 over x, and there is no pole. And also, there is not one single point on the whole axis where there is such a, a jump of the function. There is no jump. But this function is not continuous. OK, so now let's ask ourselves, what, is, what does continuity mean? What does it mean for a function to be continuous? Uh, we defined it, yeah? um, and uh, so a function f is continuous in some point a if the limit for x towards a um, of f of x is equal to f of a. That's how we defined continuity. I mean, we had an even more sophisticated definition, this epsilon delta definition. But let's look at this definition, because it writes shorter, and maybe it's more intuitive to you. Huh? OK. 
And now what's, what's very important is, what does this X towards A mean? We defined what that means. Do you remember what that means? I mean, what this whole thing means. The limit of f of x for x towards a. Who remembers the definition of this? <coughs> yes, that's good. It's a sequence. What is a sequence? Different values of x, yes. So we have, for x we have a sequence. Huh? We have a sequence, xn, with, uh, with limit n towards infinity of xn is equal to what? To a. to a, yes. Okay. So now is the answer, this is the same as this. No, because here we don't talk about our function f. So what is missing here? Okay, yeah, so tell me, what should I write? Uh, limit of n towards infinity. Yes. From uh, f of this n. Yeah. Goes to c or something else. Constant number. Also a function of a. Yeah, f of a. Here in this case it must be f of a. Okay, yeah, that's very good. Yeah? And for all among you who didn't know this, you should have asked me this on Monday. Okay, but I mean we have this one sequence with a limit and this other sequence with a limit. Um, now what's missing in our definition of continuity or let's say in our explanation of this here? What should we add to this? Yeah? It holds for all the limit of xn. For all sequences xn. That's important. Let's write this. For all sequences xn with with this comma we have huh? so if this proposition is true then our function is continuous okay and that's very important let's underline this for all sequences it's by far not sufficient if this is true for one sequence. Okay. Um, for all sequences where xn has a as a limit, f of xn must have the same limit f of a. Okay? And now we will prove that this function over there is not continuous by finding two different sequences, xn, with diff uh, where the corresponding sequences, f of xn, have two different limits and therefore it's not continuous. Okay, and the intuition is as follows. Um, so the intuition is really easy here. We take, yeah, we take this point and this point and this and this and so on. We take all these points where our function is equal to 1. So all the points where our sine of 1 over x uh, has a maximum. Okay, and uh, the corresponding xn, they are here. So this is x1, x2, ah, oh, sorry, no. Um, x2, x3, and so on. So, so this is uh, our sequence number one, 
And now we take a second sequence where we take this point and this point and this point and so on. Yeah? And, and then this is our blue x1, blue x2, blue x3 and so on. And as you immediately can see, the sequence of the function values for the first sequence converges to 1 and the sequence of the function values of the second sequence converges to 0. Huh? And this is not allowed for continuous functions. Huh? Is it not minus 1? Oh yeah, sorry, uh, of course, thank you. Yes, of course it's minus 1. Yeah. Um, oh yes, uh, sorry, but in our proof we take yeah, we, uh, our sequence has the limit zero, thank you. So this is wrong here. So we have to construct a different sequence. Oh, what's going on here? Okay, so our sequence number two must be constructed differently. It must be like this. Okay? So we take all these points where the sign is zero. Um, okay, and now look, but now look at the construction. So for our first sequence, we take xn is equal to one over n times pi half. Yeah? So pi half is the point where the sign is one. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, uh, let me see, 2 times pi half, we get pi, let me, yeah, let's look. That's not correct, what we have here. I mean, what's not correct is this. The sine of 1 over xn is not 1 all the time. So we have to take a different sequence. Yeah, that's not correct. We have to take a different sequence. What must our sequence be? We have to start with pi half. And then the next point must be here, which is pi half plus 2 times pi. Huh? And then one, the, the next point is one further period down there. Huh? So the formula must be pi half plus n times 2 pi. Yeah, that's what we have to use. I'm sorry for that. So, um, this is not correct. So, this must be xn equal to pi half plus n times 2 pi. Okay. And if we use these xn, no, we use, oh, sorry, this is, this is not correct either. I mean, 1 over xn is that, okay? And xn then is 1 over the right-hand side. And if we use these xn, then the sine of 1 over xn is 1 for all of them. Huh? Okay, and I mean this is an, an easy uh, sequence because it's constant and the limit of a constant sequence is um, 
Let me see. Um, yeah, so first the limit for n towards infinity of our xn is equal to zero. Huh? Look, this right hand side here goes to infinity for n towards infinity and uh, one over this right hand side goes to zero. So the limit of our xn is zero. Um, but that's the interesting part. The limit of the sine of one over xn is equal to one. Huh? No. Because all elements of this constant sequence are equal to one. Okay, and now we take this other sequence. Now let's see, n times pi, n times pi is here and here and so on. Okay, here is correct. Huh? These are all the zeros of our sign. Huh? Um, so we take this cn and the limit of the cn is zero and the limit of the sine of one over cn is zero too. And because these two limits are not the same, we have now proven that this function in x equals zero is not continuous. Okay, yeah. And this, of course, I mean, we, I, I don't have to mention this again. Oh, proof of exercise. Uh. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. I, uh, I mean, this is a nice consequence of what we did here. Um, so if a, function, if a function is continuous, then if you look at the limit of f of xn for some sequence xn, for n towards infinity, this is the same as f applied to the limit. Huh? So you can exchange a function and the limit. And that's a quite an important property uh, that we need sometimes. Um, but this property um, is only guaranteed if a function is continuous. Okay, yeah. Yeah, now let's uh, talk about Taylor series. Taylor series is a nice, um, a nice application of differentiation that we, uh, we engineers need almost all the time. Uh, question? I still have a question about continuity. I, uh -huh. thought, uh, I was wondering if a function is not defined for one certain value, can it still be called continuous? A function that is not defined. Because, in, like in this example, uh, this function wouldn't be defined for uh, the value of zero. There is no. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I understand. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, of course, you're right. Uh, and maybe I should have uh, written this more exactly. You are right. I cannot talk about continuity in a point where a function is not defined. And so you are right. What we did was just uh, useless. Okay? So just forget it all and uh, we continue with the next uh, section. Um, but um, I mean, as most of the time, uh, of course, I find an ex excuse. Huh? <laughs> um, and the excuse is the following. The interesting question is, whenever I have a function which is not defined at some point, then maybe we want to um, repair this undefined point. Okay? I mean, I can always define this function. And now, let's define this function at x equals zero. What do I like? I d oh, sorry. What do I like? I like zero. So I define this function now for x equals zero to be equal to zero. Okay? Maybe you prefer one, and then you would say, okay, no, I'll let me define it like that. But of course, you have to decide. You either take zero or one or minus one or whatever you want. Okay. 
And now the interesting question, and that's this whole, whole uh, example is about this. Is it possible to repair this function such that after this repair action it is continuous? Is this possible? And the answer from this proof is no, it is impossible. There is no chance to repair this function such that it is continuous afterwards. Huh? Because we have these two different sequences with different limits. Okay? For, for some other functions, it is possible to repair this undefined point in a way such that afterwards it is continuous, but here not. So this, is, this function is really inherently discontinuous. Thank you very much for this question. Okay, now let's go into Taylor series. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, let me see, how do we start? Yes. So sometimes we, we deal with functions that are not trivial. Let's say a trivial function is one that looks like this. And that's what we call a polynomial. Yeah? And why are polynomials so nice and easy? Because for computing the function values, I just need addition, multiplication, um, and that's it. Yeah? We just need addition and multiplication, and these are our basic elementary operations, and almost everything works with polynomials. For example, we can compute the integral of any polynomial very easily. Yeah? And that's why we really like polynomials. Yeah? But whenever we have something which is more difficult, then very soon we get severe problems. Maybe we are not able to compute the integral and so on. Yeah? And um, yeah, now if we have such a function, which is not trivial, where, for example, we cannot compute the integral, then maybe we want to approximate this function by a polynomial. Huh? So we then find a polynomial which is very close to this function, and then we can compute the integral, and so on. Huh? Uh, that's why Taylor series are so extremely important. Huh? Okay, and now what we do is, so we want, given such a function f, we want to find a polynomial that approximates this function very well. Yeah? <coughs> and what does it mean uh, to approximate a function very well? Let's look at a picture. Suppose this is our function f. Um, and uh, what I would like to have is, so this is f of x. I would like to have a polynomial p of x that on all x out of the real numbers, it's identical to f. Uh, that's what I would like to have. But I can tell you, you won't get this. Uh? So maybe we should uh, relax our requirements a little bit. Uh? And so what we do next is, we take some point x0, and we, we want our polynomial at this one point to be equal to f exactly equal to f. And on, on all the rest of the real numbers, it has a different value. Okay? So, if these are my requirements, and actually you, you, you see here, talking about requirements is very important in mathematics because I mean, mathematics is like um, 
like a heavy, like a, a worker who has to do some work for you. Uh, and if you ask this worker, um, if you tell a worker, maybe here in this room, to clean some tables, that's not perfect because afterwards maybe one table is cleaned and it's perfect. The, the worker fulfilled your requirements. But maybe you wanted him to clean all the tables. So you really have to tell him clean all the tables and maybe you should ask him to perfectly clean all the tables. Because otherwise only one table has been cleaned a little bit. Huh? Okay. But I mean if your requirements are too high then this worker will not be able to fulfill them. If you ask this person in five minutes to clean all the tables in the whole Fachhochschule, then this is impossible. And that's what we have here. We cannot require our, our polynomial to be identical to F everywhere. Huh? That's what we cannot get. Huh? So it's, yeah, I mean, that's why you need some experience to find out what is realistic and what not. And what happens if I just require P of X to be equal to F at one point, then the result may be this, which is not really nice, is it? No. But P of X is e P of X zero, we have P of X zero is equal to F of X zero, at least. That's what we have. But it's not sufficient. So what should we, what should we require two? So this is requirement number one. What is requirement number two? P prime of x zero is equal to f prime um, of x. Yes. Why not? P prime of x zero is equal to f prime of x zero. Okay, now let's draw such a function. Oh, we just have to change it here a little bit. So now our P may be like that. Okay? Oh no, that's too good. Maybe that's too, too good. Let's do it like like that. Okay. And now the 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 function value and the first derivative are equal. But that doesn't look nice either. No? So maybe we should require the same thing for the second derivative. And then, yeah, it must be like something like that, huh? and so on. And, okay, and what we do in, uh, in Taylor series, we actually require that our Taylor polynomial for the Taylor, Taylor for, uh, let's say for the Taylor series, which is an infinite Taylor polynomial, all derivatives must be equal to the derivative of x in this point x0, only in one point. Huh? But the more derivatives you get, the more hopefully the region where this polynomial approximates the function, the bigger this region gets. Huh? That's the, at least let us hope this. This is not true for all functions. Okay, and now, um, now I give you a, a derivation of the Taylor formula. Actually, the proof of the Taylor formula is very easy and it is so intuitive. That gives you really some mathematical feeling of what's going on in Taylor series. So please don't be afraid of this formula very easy to derive this formula.
here on this slide, no, on the next slide, on this slide you see the ansatz. Yeah? Um, so now this is a little bit different. Our polynomial starts with a 0 plus a 1 times x minus x0 plus a 2 times x minus x0 squared and so on. This is a polynomial of degree n, the same as this is a polynomial of degree n. Yeah? So there is no qualitative difference, it's just a little bit a different um, representation. Now just look at this and remember this uh, while I uh, clean the board. And remember what we required here. We wanted our polynomial uh, to have identical derivatives to the function f in one point in x0. And now, look, the different representation comes from this x0. So we replaced x by x minus x0. Yeah? And why does this make sense? Why do, why do we use x minus x0 over there? Yeah, there is a simple answer, because the following calculations are much easier. Huh? That's most of the time. Why do we do anything in mathematics? Because the rest is easier. That's very often the case. But why is it easier? Why is it easier? Tell me, what is p of x0 for this p over there? It's a0. So you see all the terms are 0. For x equal x0, everything is 0 apart... Uh, uh, so we just have a0. Huh? That's the reason why we use this representation. So our um, expansion point x0 um, makes the whole thing zero. Huh? Okay. And now, um, yeah, let's write it here. Uh, so, we require our polynomial P, P of x zero to be equal F of x zero and P prime of x zero equal f prime of x0, um, p double prime of x0, equal f double prime of x0, and so on. Okay, and now let's, um, let's compute all the, the derivatives of our polynomial. Huh? So, um, yeah, we get P of x0 is equal to a0, okay? Um, then P prime of x0 is equal to the first derivative of x, x equal x0. So what is the first derivative? I mean, this is 0, and this becomes a1. And this... <coughs> 2 a2? No, it's not 2 a2. It's not 2 a2. What is it? It's 0. It's 0. Why? Uh, the x minus x0 divides... Yes. Because the derivative of x minus x0 squared is 2 times x minus x0, and x minus x0 is, is 0 for x equal x0. Okay, so the only thing that remains is this a1. Okay, so p prime of x0 is a1. p double prime of x0 is, what is that? a2? No, it's not a2. Mm. 
What is P double prime? It's not zero either. It's two A two, thank you. Now it is two A two. And what P triple prime? Six A three. And P quadruple prime is Huh? 24. 24. 24 what? A4. A4. Yeah. Okay. And now the nth derivative of P at x0. Yeah. Thank you. N factorial A n. Okay. That's important. Yeah. Okay. And now, now we require that these derivatives are equal to the derivatives of f. That's what we have here. And I mean, we could just write it like this. Okay? Yeah. And now we look at these. Ah, uh, no, maybe we should we should also write the equation here. This is f, the nth derivative of x0, is equal to this. That's what we require. Let's put an exclamation mark here. This is our requirement. And now from this equation, from this equ we solve this equation for a n. Huh? So from this we get a n is equal to the nth derivative of f at x0 divided by n factorial. Yeah, and we are finished. This is the proof of the Taylor formula. I mean, was that difficult? It's as trivial as it can be. That's really easy. And I mean, now you understand where this n factorial in the denominator comes from. Where does it come from? From the powers, yes. From the nth derivative of the nth power. Yeah? Yeah. That's where this comes from. And the nth derivative of x f f at a, of f at x zero, I mean, where this comes from, that's quite simple. It just comes from our requirements. It comes from the requirement that the nth derivative of our function has to be equal to that of the polynomial. Okay, so now we can write that our f of x is equal to um, the sum over i equal 0 to infinity, or should we write n? Yeah, let's take an n. Um, of a n times x minus x0, uh, so let's write a n for the moment times x minus x zero to the nth power. And now, of course, we replace our a n by this f 
and derivative of x0 divided by n factorial times x minus x0 um, power n. But here, um, I mean, that was kind of um, dangerous. You know, it's dangerous all the time. You move some street or uh, move away from the streets or the autobahn because there may be a cliff you fall down or there may be some mud or dirt or... And that's... I mean, this may be a cliff. Why? Excuse me? We have to show that the proof is for one to one derivative. For one derivative? At x0. At x0, yes? We have to prove what? For x0 alone, for Oh, yeah, uh, thank you. There is, uh, I mean, first of all, there is an error here. Sorry, this must be f of x. Okay? And now what are you saying? We have proven it only for x0 up to now. Yeah. And what may happen for any other x? What may happen? It Yes, yes. You're right. You're right. For any x which is not equal to x0, this equality may not be true. Okay? So this, actually this is quite dangerous what, what we have here. This may be true, but it may not be true. I mean, what we did was just some formal derivation. Huh? And uh, so maybe we should, I mean, we are safe uh, as soon as we replace the f by a p here. Huh? I mean, this is no problem at all. Because this just defines our Taylor um, series. Huh? We just defined a new function. Yeah, okay. And, and uh, it may, may even be dangerous here still. So let's put uh, a finite number, let's call it k, here. So now you can always do this. No, not always. Uh, you see, it's, it's really, really a dangerous terrain in mathematics. This works as long as all derivatives of f up to the case derivative, if these derivatives all exist in x0, then you can do this and everything is easy. Yeah? But now what happens if we replace the k by infinity? What may happen? What ugly thing may happen here? I mean, it may happen what can happen with any series. If you have a series, what is your first question? Convergence, yes, thank you. So, this expression only makes sense if this infinite sum converges, if this infinite sum takes on a finite value. Otherwise, we are talking about infinity. And what is that? Okay, so you see, this is the... the uh, is, let's say our second cliff. The first cliff was differentiability of f. The second cliff is the infinite series. 
And now comes the third cliff, which is replacing P by F. So now what, what, what may happen here? I mean, everything is fine now. This infinite series converges. Well, that's fine. So if it converges, then it defines a function. And here we have the function. Why is it dangerous to replace the P by an F? Oh yes, the derivatives here, these are all the derivatives of this function f. I mean, that's how we constructed it. We really take the derivatives of f, not from some of that of some different function. I mean, what did I do? I replaced p by f, so the question the question that appears here is f of x equal to p of x? Big question mark. Okay? I mean, what we did up to now, let's put the p here again. What we did up to now is we produce such a Taylor series. Okay? And so we, we just derived a formula for this series. And this series defines a function p of x. But the question is, is this function p of s equal to x equal to f of x for arbitrary points x? Huh? For arbitrary points x. I mean, for the point x equal x0, this is trivial. Huh? But for any other points, that's the question. And that's the really serious question you have to ask all the time. Whenever you have a Taylor series, you have to ask yourself, um, first you have to ask, is my f differentiable often enough? If not, you can forget it. Huh? If it is differentiable, then you can write down the formula for the Taylor series. And then you have to ask yourself two questions. Question number one, does this Taylor series converge? And you can use our formula, you know, uh, the, the ratio uh, uh, test and so on. Huh? So second question is, is this Taylor series convergent? Okay, and if it converges, you have to ask uh, question number three, which is, does it converge to our function f or maybe to something else? It sounds weird, but there are examples where exactly this happens. Where our Taylor series converges, but it does not converge to the function f. And you will have such an example in your exercises. No? There is a function, a pretty nice uh, a function which is infinitely often differentiable, everything looks very nice and smooth and so on. But this function, I guess, yes, this function only converges, no, the, the Taylor series of this function only converges to the function in one point, which is the expansion point x0, and nowhere else. Huh? And that's why, I mean, the, these are really the cliffs in mathematics. And because there are such cliffs in mathematics, you, you have to study mathematics. Otherwise, if there would be no cliffs, you would just use MATLAB or Mathematica and apply it. But what happens if, um, if MATLAB or Mathematica gives you an exception and it says, okay, matrix not invertible or whatever, and then uh, is the question, what was wrong? And then you really need to understand mathematics. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah.
Yeah, what we have here is this proof. Um, yeah. So you see here in this uh, box, f of x is equal to the polynomial, and this capital P here is a finite polynomial. This is not a series. That's a difference. A series is infinitely long. This is a finite initial part of the, se of the series. Yeah? So we just cut the series after the term of order n. And then, of course, we make an error. Yeah? And this Rn of x, the so-called remainder term, is the error we, we make by cutting uh, our series after the nth order term. Okay, and of course we want to know, or we would like to know, this uh, cutoff error we make. And there are formulas for this. Okay, uh, but before let's look at such a nice example. Um, so we take the exponential function um, and we expand it into a, a Taylor series at x equals zero at this point. Huh? And we cut this sequence. If we cut it after the first order term, which means the linear term, no, no, sorry, after the, the zeroth order term, then we get this. We get a constant function which is equal to one. Huh? So it's the, the, it's actually f of x0, which is f of 0, this is 1. Yeah? Or maybe you look at the expansion here. If we cut it here, right here, then that's this uh, brown line. If we cut it after the first order term, you see we get something linear, 1 plus x, which is this. And then the second order is a parabola, which is the blue one. And the third order is the red one. And, uh, yeah, and this is the function itself. Yeah. You see, it approximates our function the better, the higher the order is. Okay, and now let's look at the theorems. Um, and here we have it. So if our function from su on some interval defined is n plus 1 times continuously differentiable. I mean, that's the first interesting point. We don't just need n times continuously differentiable. We need it n plus 1 times. So in order to get a polynomial of degree n, it has to be n plus 1 times continuously differentiable. I mean, and this, dep uh, this is due to the, the formula for the remainder term. Look here, the remainder term is 1 over n factorial times this integral. And in this integral, the n plus first derivative of f appears, and that's why we need n plus 1 times continuous differentiability. Okay, and this is a nice formula, simple formula. Huh? You just have to compute the n plus first uh, derivative, which is not difficult. And then you put it into this integral, and this term is simple too, x minus t to the power n, and then you take the integral over this variable t from x0 to x. So it's easy to write down this remainder term, but what is not easy at all? Evaluating this integral is not easy at all. Why? Because, because this function f is a non-trivial function. If f would be, uh, let's say, a polynomial, 
I mean, the, you can, I mean, why don't you do it? Just take SF a polynomial and develop it in a Taylor, Taylor series. What would you think would be the result? It would, of course, be the polynomial itself. Huh? So it doesn't make sense. Uh, it only makes sense for non-trivial functions. But if f is, is a non-trivial function, and then you multiply it with this term to the power n, it's even more non-trivial. So typically, you wouldn't be able to compute this integral. No chance. Huh? That's the unfortunate thing about this here. Huh? And that's why we need this second theorem here about the Lagrangian form of the remainder term. And this theorem just says, under the same uh, assumptions, we get a, a different formula for the remainder term. I mean, this formula is a consequence uh, of this. And now let's look at, oh yes, I, I, we have to read this sentence. Then there is a C between x0 and x, such that this holds. I mean, this formula is even simpler than that because we have no integral anymore. But, it is actually impossible to calculate this. Why? Oh yes, but this is not really a problem because we know the function f. We know the function f, and we can compute the n plus first derivative. That was uh, the assumption here. So this is no problem. What is the problem? Yes, that's it. Look, this sentence, that's like in mathematics. Then there is a c between x0 and x. There is one, but nobody tells you which one to take. And there are infinitely n many numbers between x0 and x. That's mathematics. Uh, why can't these mathematicians tell us the name of this C? I mean, I can tell you because we get from this integral formula this formula by using the, uh, the intermediate value theorem of integral theory. And when we use this intermediate, intermediate value theorem, the theorem says there is some c between x0 and x. And uh, it doesn't tell us which c it is. No? OK, yeah. Mm. So now. I mean, we can either, either use this formula or that. Uh, uh, both are not perfect, but that's how this world is. Most of the time, <coughs> we use this formula. Because this is even impossible. Because you cannot uh, symbolically compute the integral. I mean, you can use this formula too and do just a numeric integration. That's what you can do, and then you get an approximation of the remainder term. And here, what you get is an approximation too. And we will see in an example how we apply uh, this Lagrangian form. Okay, yeah, let's go into the, let's take the, I mean, this example, we go back to this example again, and uh, what we did before was something very risky because we just wrote down the Taylor expansion of the exponential function without knowing whether it converges or not. So we didn't know that it converges and we didn't know that it co converges to our function. Yeah? And now we will prove that our Taylor series converges to the exponential function. Yeah? And so we could, we could now do two things. First, prove that the series converges. And second, prove 
that the limit is equal to the exponential function. Yeah? Um, so we could use the, the ratio test, for example, uh, to, to prove that it converges. Um, but what we do now is, um, let's look at, yeah, at the construction of our Taylor uh, polynomial. I mean, this is the basic equation. Our function is equal to the polynomial plus some remainder term. Okay? Um, or maybe Rn of x is equal to f of x minus p of x. Maybe this is even more intuitive. Because here you really see the remainder is the difference between function and polynomial. So what must we show to prove that our polynomial converges to the function? We have to prove that for n towards infinity this remainder term goes to zero. I mean it's trivial but that's, uh, that's all we have to do. So let's, let's just take the formula for the remainder term and prove it goes to zero. Okay, yeah. And what we have here for the exponential function, this is the Taylor polynomial. Yeah? Um, and uh, as an expansion point, we use x equal zero. Huh? Yeah. I mean, that's what we had uh, two slides before. And now we take the Lagrangian form of the remainder term. Let's go back here. So we take the n plus first derivative of f at this intermediate position c. n plus first derivative of x. What is the n plus first derivative of the exponential function? It is the exponential function at this point z. And then what, will we, what else do we have? Sorry n plus 1 factorial in the denominator, that's what we have here too, times x minus x0, and x0 is 0, so we get x to the power n plus 1. That's what we have here. So this is the remainder term <coughs> for some c between x and x0. Okay, but here the situation is like that. Zero, x, and uh, this is equal to x zero. Okay, so our c is somewhere in between here. Um, so c is between zero and x. And that means the absolute value of c is smaller than x, than that of x. That's what we have here. Okay. So now, if C absolutely is smaller than the absolute value of X, then, um, yeah, if we look here, the C only appears in the exponential function. And the exponential function is strictly monotonic. And because of that, we can just write our remainder term is less than or equal to what we have. Oh, it's actually, it's, uh, it's even true that it is smaller than. Because if c is smaller than x, absolutely, then this is smaller than that. So you, c you can delete this, uh, this equality part here. Okay, yeah. So you see what we did. We, we replaced our c, which we did not know, by x. But we don't get it for free. We, we now have to replace the rn equal to 
by uh, less than. Huh? R n is smaller than this this guy here. Huh? Okay, and um, this term which depends on n, we call it B n. And now we have to prove that our Rn uh, goes to zero for n towards infinity. And our Rn is smaller than Bn. And now we look at our Bn and apply the ratio test. We apply the ratio test. We just compute Bn plus 1 divided by Bn. Okay, so let's look at this. Bn plus 1, maybe we write it on the blackboard. Uh, <coughs> is equal to, what is Bn plus 1? e to the power x plus 1 times... Uh, n plus 2 divided by n plus 2 factorial times. Um, oh, sorry, no, this is e to the power x, of course. Not x, not x plus 1, times e to the power x times x power n plus 1 and here times n plus 1 factorial. And now this cancels out and this cancels out with this and we get x absolute value divided by n plus 2. That's what we have here. And now look at this. For n towards infinity, this goes to zero. But be careful, because we are talking about um, a power series. The Taylor series is a power series. And this has to be true for arbitrary x. But the point is the following. We fix our x and let n go to infinity. And for any fixed x, this go to, goes to zero for fixed x. Huh? Okay, so this ratio goes to zero. And now if we look at the ratio criterion, uh, the ratio test, then it tells us that the corresponding series, which is this, converges. Okay? But now we know that a series can only converge if the corresponding sequence of the Bn goes to zero. So now we know that the limit of the Bn is zero. Now because, uh, and let's, now let's look at this inequality. The remainder term is smaller than our Bn, and therefore, if the Bn go to zero, then of course the remainder term does too. For all x, for all real numbers x. Okay, and now we have proven that the remainder term goes to zero, and therefore, this uh, difference between f and the polynomial goes to zero. So we have now proven that the Taylor series of the exponential function converges to the function, to the exponential function. Okay, and now everything is fine. And, I mean, what's really nice is um, that for this function, the exponential function, for any x, the Taylor series converges, no matter how far 
our x is from the expansion point zero. Uh, no matter where. Uh, that's, I mean, that's uh, uh, the best we could ever expect. Okay, yeah. And we will, we will soon see an example where this is not the case. Um, yeah, but now first let's look at this nice application example. Um, this is a typical example for, an, for the application of Taylor series. We have an integral, and this integral cannot be trivially ev evaluated. Now what we do is, we develop the function in the integral, which is the square root of 1 plus x power 3. We develop this function in a Taylor series. Yeah? And uh, this is the Taylor series up to the term of third order. We just cut it after the third order term. Huh? And then, of course, this is only an approximation for the, for the function, but let's hope it's a good approximation, and then, hopefully, the integral over this new function is an approximation for our original integral. So now we can write this integral is approximately equal to that integral, and now we, I mean, and you see the big advantage. Now we have a polynomial. It's easy to integrate the polynomial and uh, evaluate it, and we get this value. Yeah? The exact value would be this. Yeah? So you see the error is below 10%. Yeah? If you would like to have a better approximation, what would you do then? Higher order volume. Hmm? Higher order volume. Yeah, yeah. You develop it to a higher order and you would get a better approximation. Unfortunately, I mean, if we, if we do not know the exact value, then here we have no idea uh, whether it's an error of 10% or only of um, 10 to the power minus 6, or maybe it's an error of 100%. We have no idea. How can we get an idea about this cutoff error? Yeah. We, we, we calculate the remainder term. Huh? And um, so... Yes, it's, it's, it's not easy to exactly know the remainder term, but we can do the same thing we did here. Huh? We, can, we can just use the Lagrangian form of the remainder term and uh, replace, for example, our C by, by X, um, and then uh, we get an upper bound for the remainder term. And, I mean, for this remainder term, when we have an upper bound, then we really know, okay, uh, that then we, we, we have at least an estimate of the accru accuracy. Yeah. But be careful. So don't, in the, uh, in the exam, uh, write, okay, Professor Ertl said, uh, whenever we replace our C by X, then this is an upper bound for the remainder term. No. This is true for this example, but not all the time. Um, now let's look at this situation again. Um, yeah. So the point is this. Here we have our expansion point x0. And yeah, let's take the yeah, let's take the exponential function, yeah? And now we, we develop it not at zero, but at some other point. And now we want to know the value at some point x, which is here. But the remainder term is only known for some value c in between. Oh no, the exponential function is not good here, because it's too easy, sorry. We take something else. 
um, we take a function which maybe has a maximum here somewhere. Huh? And what do we need for the remainder term? We need the n plus first derivative of x. So suppose this is the n plus first derivative of x, of f. Huh? And now, what can you do if you know that this f n plus first derivative looks like that? Then, of course, we can we can look at this maximum and take this value, this maximum value, and this then, of course, is an upper bound for this n plus first derivative of x in the whole interval. So when you take this maximum, then you have an upper bound and you can work with this maximum. And you can see if this would be the exponential function, you see why we took x, because it's uh, strictly monotonic, and so you can just take the right bound or border of this interval uh, as a maximum. Huh? Okay, yeah, so let's finish at this point. Thank you.